we all have people problems. They're, 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 that's just the truth. If, you, if you've been alive on this earth at all, you, we've all got people problems. Just as the little girl was telling us, seven years old already has a, a little bit of a people problem. And where did it start? Right at home. And I know exactly how she feels because I'm sure my brothers, all that are younger than me, as soon as they came in this world, realized they had people problems because they had an older brother that terrorized them most of their childhood. <laughs> so people problems it is something that we deal with. But all the people problems that we deal with, there are different personalities and different styles and different people. And today I want to talk to you about one particular person. And I want to talk to you about the discourager. Um, a lot of times in life we have people that are negative and that are really a discouragement. And I'm not really talking about people that are have their cup just half empty. You know, there's always those people that I'm, my cup's half full, my cup's half empty. No, there's always the optimist and the pessimist. I'm not talking, I'm talking specifically today about the discourager. The one that's always focused on your negatives. Always focused on the negatives of the situation. You know, the truth is, no matter, um, no matter how old you are, when you live life in this world, Jesus said, in this world there's going to be tribulation. In this world we're going to have problems. The truth is, though, when you're in the midst of a tribulation, when you're in the midst of a storm, when you're in the midst of a problem, a tough situation, the last thing you need is a discouraging person in your life. So how do we deal with that? That's the, that's the question. How do we deal with discouraging people? In the Bible today, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 8. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I encourage you to either open it up or turn it on and go to Luke chapter 8. That is where we're going to be. If you follow along on your uh, FBC Don't Eat em app, uh, I encourage you to go to events and you go down to Sermon Notes. And there you will find my sermon notes for today. And you'll be able to follow along right as we go. And you'll see all of the different points that I'm going to make and look at today as we go through Luke chapter 8. So let me give you a, a little bit of what's going on here in Luke chapter 8. I love Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 is full of excitement. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm a movie guy. I love movies. I love going to the movies. I owe my wife a movie right now. She wants me to take. She wants me to take her to see Aladdin. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, she wants to go, and I've got to do that. And so, hopefully, this next week, in the next few days, we'll have that opportunity. But I do. I love movies. When you look at Luke chapter eight, you could go about halfway down to about verse twenty-six, and you could really, or even verse twenty-two, you could really start to develop a very cool movie. You, you, could, you could do a biography movie right here about the miracles of Jesus. Uh, so our text is going to be in Luke 8, 49 through 56. But I want to back up and just sort of give you a picture of what is going on in Luke chapter 8. See, it starts in verse 22. And in verse 22, it says, And now one of those days Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let's go over to the other side. If you're familiar with some of the miracles of Jesus, you might know what's about to happen. What happens is they get into a storm and the winds start to blow and the boats start to rock and the disciples start to freak and Jesus gets up and he calms the storm. And so after Jesus calms the storm, it says in verse 26, then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. So they go and they sail on the opposite side and they end up in the land of the Gerasenes. And if you remember, several weeks ago, I preached on this text here. This is the crazy man running around in the tombs. And Jesus shows up and here is this crazy man that nobody has been able to tame. Nobody has been able to help. They've tried to chain him down. Chains do not hold him down. He breaks them. They try to do all kinds of things. If you remember, I sort of related him to an old neighbor of mine. You know, I've had people problems all my life. We had a crazy neighbor named Crazy Ricky Baker. If you missed that, you need to go back. All of those sermons now, we keep them on that app. If you go to sermon, you need to go find the one about Crazy Ricky Baker and about the man that's in the tombs of the garrisons. But you have this crazy man that nobody could help, nobody could tame. 
I mean, he begins to cut himself, the scriptures tell us. But Jesus and all his power and authority show up. And Jesus cast the demons out of this man. And he cast them into the swine. The swine run off the cliff and they die. And, and after that, Jesus goes again and he moves on from that situation. The next situation we see is we see a man by the name of Jairus come up to him. All of a sudden, this man Jairus, who is a, who is a, a soldier and a, a leader there in that community, comes up and he's like, hey, my daughter is deathly ill. Deathly ill. And Jesus, we need your help. And Jesus says, well, let's go do this. I mean, I can help you. And so he, he begins to follow this man named Jairus to his house. On the way, though, other people, by this time, people, the, the word had spread that this Jesus is there and he is healing the lame, the blind are seeing, the, those that have been, you know, overcome by demons for years are being set free. And so this crowd begins to develop around Jesus as he is walking to this man's house to help his daughter. And these people are coming to him and they're being healed. People are being healed left and right. In fact, one woman that didn't even want to bother Jesus, who had dealt with a blood issue for years, she sneaks her way in through the crowd with faith that if she could just touch the master and just touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. And so she sneaks her way into Jesus and just touches the hem of his garment and she is healed. The scripture tells us that Jesus felt that power. And I, and if it, I think it was the combination of that Holy Spirit and her faith that ignited that healing when it came together and he felt it just leave his body. And he's like, well, wait a second, who just touched me? And he begins to look around and nobody would confess. And wait a second. And then all of a sudden there's this little lady. And he confronts her and he's like, it was you. And she's like, yes. And he's like, well, you are healed. And, and, and she'd suffered for so long. And then the scripture says that he continues on. And he goes past this. And remember, now he is heading over to see the daughter of Jairus. And so in verse 49, as he is getting close he gets there and it says in verse 49 and while he was still speaking to someone or while he was still speaking someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying your daughter has died do not trouble the teacher anymore and so here you have this man who just received <laughs> The most tragic news he had probably ever received in his life. One of the things that I've heard people throughout my ministry say is, the truth is everybody in this room has either already dealt with death in their life or you're going to have to deal with death at some point. Because the truth is, none of us are promised tomorrow we're all going to die and the people that we love, they die too. But one of the hardest things to deal with that I'm told is the death of a child. As a parent, we look at our children and we think, they're going to outlive me. My job is not to bury you. Your job's to bury me. And to change my diapers when I'm really old. Yes, yes. That's your job, son. Change my diapers. I mean, but that's what we think, right? That, that is, that's, that's what we think. That, so you're not supposed to, to bury your children. He just got the news right there in front of Jesus that your daughter has died, leave this man alone. Because whoever was giving him this news, this, this official from the synagogue, didn't have the faith in Jesus that he could raise the dead. He thought this was beyond his spectrum of healing, his spectrum of miracles. He didn't believe that he had the power. His power was limited to this. They said, your daughters die. But in verse 50, it says, but when Jesus heard this, he answered him, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe and she will be made well. So immediately as the discourager, this official from the synagogue comes up and immediately begins to discourage this man, Jesus flips it around and says, oh, oh wait a second. 
There's no need for discouragement at this point. I am present. I am here. And there is nothing that is out of my range of power. All you must do is believe. Don't listen to them. Put the discouragement out of your mind. Put this out of your way. Don't listen and don't be afraid any longer. Only believe and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he didn't allow anyone to enter with him except for Peter and John and James and the girl's father and mother. And now when they were all weeping and lamenting for her, he said, stop weeping for she is not dead, but she's asleep. So Jesus shows up and says, listen, hush your whining, hush your crying, quit this morning because it's useless because she's not even dead. She's just asleep. What you're about to see is this girl that you think that is dead, rise up and walk. This girl that you thought was sick is about to walk through here in front of you in just a moment and she will be 100% well. So you need to stop your crying, put all that away. I'm about to take care of business. And the next thing that we see is the people that were crying, that were crying out, that were wailing. It says, and they began to laugh at him. <laughs> Have you ever had somebody just laugh at you in, 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 a, in a situation? Just look at you and just laugh at you. you just, what are you talking about? This ain't happening. That's the kind of laugh. It wasn't like a happy laugh. It was one of those sarcastic, ha, <laughs> ha, you know, whatever. <laughs> you tell me to stop crying. I know the girl's dead. What are you going to do? Ha, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Whatever. Whatever, Jesus. And the Bible says that they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Verse 54, he, however, he took her by the hand. And called saying, child arise. And her spirit returned and she got up. And immediately, and she gave her orders for something to be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But he instructed them to tell no one what happened. I, wanted, I want us to just take a few moments this morning and look at this scripture. And I want to help you and help myself learn how that we together can avoid discouraging people. When we find ourselves in situations that are tough, when we find ourselves in situations that aren't ideal, and people begin to discourage us, people begin to laugh at us, I want us to learn this morning how we deal with this. And the best one to look at is Jesus himself. The first thing I want you to understand, and what I want you to notice that Jesus did, and he made sure that he did, is he made sure he was surrounded by positive people. He made sure that in this situation, which was a dire situation, a situation that needed a miracle, he didn't need negativity around him. He needed to have positivity right there. People that were encouragers, people that supported him. The scripture says, and when he came into the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except for Peter and John and James. If you remember last week when we were going through our scripture, I was talking about Peter. Remember, last year, Peter was the guy that was giving, a, giving bad advice to Jesus. He was the bad influence last year, last week, even though Peter is one of Jesus' right-hand people. I mean, we get bad advice, and we, get, we can sometimes be influenced by people that are close to us and good people that have good intentions, but they can be a bad influence. But Peter wasn't a bad person. Peter was one of Jesus's core people. And, and I believe that Peter was one of them. And, and that's because he was a great encourager. I believe he was one of those that was ready to stand up. He was ready for a, a fight, whether it be a spiritual fight or a physical fight, most of the time Peter was ready. He thought, if Jesus is on my side, I can win this thing. That's the kind of people you need in your corner. 
The kind of people that you need in bad situations, when you're facing situations like this man is here, you need people in your corner that says, when God is for us, who could be against us? Let's go do this. They're going to battle with you in prayer, and they're going to constantly be there and be an encouragement to you. And so Jesus, realizing the situation that he was going into, and he's about to battle, he takes three men with him. The three men that were probably his greatest encouragers, the three men that probably he trusted the most, those three men, Peter, John, and James, they went with him. And they said he let nobody else come in. So he gets in there, and you've got all these people weeping and crying and everything else. And yeah, they got their last laugh, I guess you should say, or Jesus ended up getting the last laugh. But he takes in with him those that were positive, those that were on his side. We need those kind of people in our life. Another person, the Bible talks about positive people and encouraging people. If you go over in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 11, in Acts chapter 11, it talks a lot, as we get into that, that chapter, it talks a lot about the persecution of the first church. And the truth is, when you talk about that first church and how persecuted they were because of their faith, they were under intense scrutiny. They were constantly being watched. People were losing their lives. They had these little hidden churches all over the place because they were being attacked. The Bible says that after Stephen was stoned, Stephen, who's considered the first martyr of faith, after he, after he was stoned to death out in the streets, it really sent the church on a frenzy. I mean, think about this. Nowadays, we have special situations and we have uh, special safety teams and things like that put together specifically because Churches nowadays are scared from attacks from the outside coming in. I mean, we can just remember right down in San Antonio, it hasn't been too long that somebody walked into a church and started to shoot. And immediately when, the, when it hits the news, immediately churches begin to, oh my goodness, that could happen here. What would we do? We need a game plan. We need to, we're, we're, it, it heightens our attention that we put toward those things. And right now, the church in general in the United States is at, it is at a more of a heightened state because of some of the things that are happening. So you think about that. Think about these Christians in Jerusalem at the stoning of Stephen. They're panicking because people are dying and they just killed Stephen. The Bible says that they begin to scatter they begin to run. And in verse 11, I mean chapter 11 of Acts, it says this. The news about them, talking about that church in Jerusalem, the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas. Now, the church in Jerusalem, which had scattered, had sent people out. They're running from that persecution. One of the places they ran to was to Antioch. And so they've ran to Antioch. They've sort of established there. The church back in Jerusalem, those that had stayed, heard about them in Antioch. And so they sent this man named Barnabas. Scripture says in verse 23, And then when he arrived and he witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. We all need Barnabases in our life. We all need men like Barnabas that is an encourager. He is showing, he specifically was sent by the church from Jerusalem to go to Antioch because these people that were in Antioch had fled Jerusalem because of the persecution. He goes there and his job is strictly to encourage, to be positive. Why? Because we need positive people in our life. If we are going to avoid discouragement, we must have positive people. Paul did the same thing. When you go back and you look at Thessalonians and some of the things that that church dealt with in his, in Thessalonians chapter three, verse two, he says, we sent Timothy, our brother, God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you 
in your faith. He, they're sending these people because they are great encouragers. Because most likely in that church, because I tell you, church is full of them. They were full of discouragers. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? Oh my goodness, they're killing people in the street. We just need to shut church down. We can't go outside. Do you know what? The, you know what's going on out there? Oh my goodness, are you crazy? What? We're gonna send. We're sending Mick outside. That's okay. Just don't send Pastor Craig. You know, I said. But I mean, you have all these discouragers. That it's just like the world is coming to an end. Well, yeah, bad things are coming are going on around us at all points and all time. But guess what? God is still on his throne. He has not moved. He is still has all the authority and all the power. And Jesus is at his right hand interceding on your behalf. And what you need is people in your life that will remind you of that. When things get tough, you need Barnabas and you need Timothy to be there and to say, hey, it's going to be okay. Don't listen to those discouragers. No, we don't need to turn the lights off. We are a light to this world. And God is going to protect us. And if he doesn't and we lose our life, bless God for it because we will be with him for eternity. We can do this and we can do it together. Those are the people you need. Right. You know what's cool right here is I look at both of these and it was churches that sent them out. Why don't we as a church send more people to help other churches. You know, there, there's a big deal going on in the Southern Baptist right now, and, and it's called church revitalization. Because the truth is, mostly small churches, small churches in small towns like this one, they're not growing, they're dying. And, and, and they're having trouble getting people to even help them change. They don't even know what to do. They're just dying. But so many churches get consumed with what we got going on right here. How come we're not taking a Barnabas or, or a Timothy and saying, hey, listen, you need to go down there. Just go down there for a few weeks. Just go down there for a couple of months. Go help them. They need encouragement. They need some of this excitement over there. No, instead, it's like, well, you know, if they close the doors, that, that's probably more time money for us. Yeah. That's the way most churches think. Instead, we ought to be sending out these encouragers to go help these folks. We need to be partnering with them. In 1 Thessalonians 5, that same, that same chapter that we, we read that Paul sent Timothy, we read that in verse 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build, one another, uh, and build up one another just as you are doing. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, but encourage the fainted heart. Help the weak and be patient with everyone. That, that, that there was a theme there in that Thessalonica church that Paul was trying to get across. Encourage, encourage. I'm sending you an encourager. Continue to encourage one another because when times are tough, we need positive people around us. We have to surround ourselves with positive. Second thing, we have to ignore the negativity. There is always going to be, you know, negative Ned or sad Sally or whatever you want to call them that are just there, that are woe is me and woe is you, and that are always negative and always in your ears. Oh, you can't do this. You don't want to do that. Oh, the last time I saw somebody do that, they failed. Oh, the last time somebody tried that, they failed. No, you need positive people in your life. And you have to ignore those negative ones. You have to just, whoop, I'm not listening. Go away. The scripture tells us that they began laughing at him. Jesus shows up and it's not over. Yeah, you may think it's over, he tells them, but it's not over. And the Bible says that they laughed. They looked at Jesus and laughed at him. You can't do that. Have you ever had somebody do that to you? Just look straight at your face and just laugh and say, ah, you can't do that. You can't beat them. You can't succeed at that. No, you're too young. No, you're too old. No, never happened. You're too slow. You know, you're not smart enough. You don't have the education. Negative, 
negative, negative, negative. And you just have to silence it. I'm not listening to it. I'm not focused on your negativity. Don't bring that to me. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock you out of this room. Or I'm going to lock you out of my mind. No negativity around me, the Bible says, that he, they began laughing at him knowing that she had died. And he, however, you see that? He, however. That, that's the two important words. He, however. Because it was, it's like just saying, okay, they're laughing at me, but however, I'm ignoring you and I'm moving right on. Because I've got a job to do. I've got something to accomplish for the kingdom. I've got a girl to save. And you can sit out here and laugh all you want. I got my homies, Peter, John, and James with me. And we're going in here. And we've got positive attitudes. And we're fighting for the kingdom. And you, huh, you're nothing. I'm going in here and taking care of business. So the scripture said he locked him out. He went in by himself. He went in alone with his people. However, he took her hand and he called out and said, Child, arise. Because it's not over. When it comes to Jesus, it's never over. I don't care what you're going through in here today. Understand this. It's not over. It is not over. And you may have people in your life right now telling you it's done. It's over. It's not. You may have people in here telling you right now as you go and you open up your checkbook and you look at all the debt you have. And they say you just need to just give up. File bankruptcy. Just walk away from it all. It's not over. God can help you through that. You have people that are looking at you and they see your family and they see what you're going through and they see that maybe whatever you're dealing with, you ought to just walk away. It's not over. Your marriage, not over. Amen. Whatever it is, not over. It's not over. You need people in your life telling you it's not over. You can get through it. No matter what has happened, no matter what the battle, you got a bad diagnosis at the doctor this week? It's not over. It's not over. Jesus was saying, it's not over. You can laugh all you want. I'm silencing the negativity. And I'm focusing on one thing. And I'm focusing on the kingdom purpose that is at hand here. God's getting glorified. And that girl got raised. Job was very familiar. If you know, if you've read the book of Job, Job was very familiar with negativity. If you've never read the book of Job, go read it. That's another, that's another movie right there. You know, I mean, you know, if you're if you're one of those people, how many of you by a raising of hands ever saw that movie Castaway? And, and anybody that's an old Tom Hanks movie. If you're if you're under 30, you probably I said, John, you saw that movie, buddy? I'm proud of you, man. John, John Fitchin being in high school, he's already ahead of y'all because he's seen Castaway with Tom Hanks. Great movie with one guy and a volleyball in it. You know, I mean, but if you could sit there and watch that, I tell you, a movie about Job would be awesome. But if you don't know the story of Job, Job was this rich, wealthy billionaire, okay, that had everything that you could imagine. And all of a sudden, Within a matter of just a few days, Job had all of his wealth stolen from him. His children died in a tornado or a hurricane or some kind of giant tsunami wind. I don't know. The Bible just says this crazy wind came and tore the house down and killed them all. And then he got all of these sores on his body and his health was attacked. This all happens to Job. Talk about negativity. His wife comes to him and just says, curse God and die. I mean, I don't even want you anymore, Job. Just get out of here. But he has three friends. And these three friends come, and the only good thing they do is for the first little while, they just come and they sit with Job in silence. They don't say anything. I will tell you, sometimes, when people are going through a, a rough patch, when people are going through something terrible in their life, and you say, man, I just don't know what to say. Have you ever said that? I just don't know what to say. That's a good example. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. Sometimes you just need to show up. 
Sometimes you just need to be there. Because sometimes when we start saying something, we end up like these three friends that should have never opened their mouths. Because the only thing they had was negativity. Negative, negative, negative. And when you go on and you read through the, the story of Job, which is a great story of redemption, great story of redemption, because everything Job lost, God gave back to him and then multiplied it. God pulled Job out of the worst situation that we could probably imagine, and he brought him back up and put him on the mountain. But the whole time that he is working through that, he's got these three negative friends in his ear. Whack. Watch, 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 just, I mean, eat me up. And when it all came and finished, Job 42, 7, God grabs a hold of one of the friends and he says this to him. My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right. My servant Job has. He, look, he gets a hold of one of them friends and says, you weren't much of anything or any help in this whole situation. You were a total negative Nelly, just bringing Job down. And what you spoke of me was totally against all of my character and who I am. And my servant Job knows who I am. And we know that by Job chapter 19, verse 25. And that's where we get this famous quote. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. You silence the negativity and you focus on the fact that our Redeemer lives. That God is on his throne. That Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. That he is interceding on your behalf no matter what you're going through. Nothing can remove him from that throne. Colossians 3.1. You know what Paul says? Paul says this. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Meaning, silence the negativity Quit worrying about the people around you and what they think and focus on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and he will never be moved. Right. You've got to focus on Christ and silence and ignore the negativity. But lastly, you need to silence Satan with your faith. Your biggest weapon or biggest defense in this entire thing is you try to avoid and do away with that negative and, and, and do away with all of the discouragement and do away with those negative things in your life. The biggest tool you have is your faith. In verse 50 of that scripture, as Jesus is right there. You remember the, the, when we read in verse 49, the servant or the official from the synagogue comes out and is like, hey, your daughter is dead. Leave this teacher alone. Jesus looked at Jairus and he said to him in verse 50, but when Jesus heard this, he answered him, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be overwhelmed with fear or sadness. Okay? Because I know you think your daughter's dead. But ignore the negative comment that you just heard. Forget about this guy's discouraging words. And focus on me because we're going to be positive here. And he said to him, forget that. Don't be, don't be afraid any longer. Only believe that she will be made well. He says, let your faith ignite what's about to happen. Only believe. And then in verse 55, we notice, and her spirit returned, and she got up, and immediately, she got up immediately, and she gave orders for something to be given to her to eat. It was because of the faith, his faith, that ignited the power of Jesus, because he believed. And it is your faith that's going to get you through all of the discouraging words and negative comments. It's your faith that's going to keep you going. And it's the faith of others that's going to help you. You've got to surround yourself with positive people of the same faith that believe, that are going to encourage you, that are going to move you forward. One of Satan's greatest tools 
is discouragement. If Satan can discourage you today, he will start to destroy your life. And all of that discouragement that is coming your way is lies after lie after lie. Every time somebody tells you, you can't do it, you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, lies, lies, lies. Jesus said that Satan is the father of lies. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus reminds us and he says, as he's talking to some of the, the evil uh, Pharisees of that day, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you don't, you don't do the desires, and you do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand in truth because there is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar, the father of lies. And when you allow the father of lies to sneak in and start lying to you, telling you that it's not going to happen, then you're right. It's going to destroy your life. But when you won't listen to those lies and you will silence the negativity and you'll surround your people with people of faith that are encouraging, that will build you up and you will put on your shield of faith for battle, you can overcome anything. You can get through it. Because Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16, he says, in addition to all, as he's talking about the the, as he's talking about the armor of God and putting on all of these different things that help you in your spiritual fight. He says, in addition to all of these, everything I've told you about, you know, everything that I've said, the sword of the Lord, the shoes of salvation, as you put on all this, in addition to those, here's what you need. You take up the shield of faith, which with you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. You pick up that shield of faith and you believe that Jesus is sitting next to the Father, interceding on your behalf, and as long as Jesus is with you, nobody can be against you. And you hold that shield and you fight. No matter what you're going through today, you fight. The problem is, what do you do when you don't have a shield? What do you do when you don't have faith? Because some of you might be in that boat today. And what I mean is you, you don't have faith. You, you know about Jesus. You've heard about Jesus. But you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You have never made him the Lord of your life. You have never said, Jesus, here I am. I am your servant. Take me. Forgive me. You may call yourself a Christian, but the truth is you have no faith. Maybe that is you. Maybe that's your biggest struggle. Today... Don't walk out of here without knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Don't walk out of here without a shield of faith that will protect you. Don't walk out of here like that. Today, come and know Jesus Christ. He gave his life for you on the cross so you could be forgiven. He, he died and rose again on the third day like he said he would. He is the Son of God that sits at the right hand of the Father, and he is coming back soon. But greater than coming back soon, the greatest part is he wants to be a part of your life. Put your faith in him. If you've never done that, I invite you to do that today. Do not leave this room today without knowing Jesus. If you're here and you want to know him as your personal savior, what I invite you to do is just stay back. As everybody leaves in just a moment, I invite you to stay. Let me talk to you. Let me show you through God's word how you can know him. Don't listen to the words of discouragement because right now Satan's shooting darts at you and you don't have the faith to fend them off. And he's saying, don't go up there. That preacher don't know what he's talking about. They can't help you. There's no help for you. No, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I know you're scared. You should be scared. He's going to laugh at you. I promise you, there's nobody going to laugh at you. This is the most serious moment of your life. Take advantage of it today. All you have to do is stay. And I would be happy to talk to you. Mick would talk to you. Matt would stay up here and talk to you. Toby will be here to talk to you. We just ask you to stay. Maybe you're here, though, and you feel like that shield is just getting weak. You say, Pastor, I've got a shield. But, man, it has taken some blows. And I'm getting discouraged. And I need some positive reinforcement. 
I need somebody with some big shields to come up around me. I want you to understand when I invite you to stay after church every Sunday, what I'm saying is let me with my shield, let Mick with his shield, let Toby with his shield partner with you. We want to fight with you. That's why we're here. That's what we're supposed to do for each other. That's why those churches were sending out Timothy and Barnabas, because we want to fight with you. When you walk out these doors and you go do it by yourself, that's not what it's intended. Church is intended for us to fight together. You can't do it on your own. You can't. Let us help you. Let us fight with you. Maybe you're here today and you're looking for a church. And God has led you here and you're saying, I need a church that will fight with me. And I believe this is where God wants me. We invite you to stay. If you have questions about membership, question about baptism, we invite you to stay and talk to us. We want to talk to you. We want to pray with you. Listen, if you're going to avoid discouragement, it starts with surrounding yourself with positive people of the faith. You've got to ignore all the negativity in your life. You've got to silence Satan with your faith and stay focused on the cross.